So everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank the Institute for People's Enlightenment for inviting me, and it's an honor to share the virtual stage with others interested in researching and talking about the life of Louise Langdon Little. So to my topic, her importance to Grenada's stories. And I can well imagine that some would ask, is she important to Grenada's stories? Well, in my estimation, she is, and I'll try to explain why. We see around us every day the need for stories that help to shape our perspectives, both the historical accounts and the fictional narratives that certainly in the experience of Caribbean writing are often born from historical accounts. To help us think through the conundrum that is the colonial legacy, we need writers, essayists, historians. And when I talk about Louise Langdon's importance to Grenada's stories, I am referring to all of those forms of writing and more. Grenada, like other places in the Caribbean, has been heavily shaped by colonial stories. And this is not only about those who had high school education and studied in universities. The colonial authorities in the Caribbean, I would say, did a remarkable job in different ways for them and for us with the foundational primary school education from long ago. Even though the texts are different now, the legacy remains. The work done with Louise Langdon, her generation, generations that followed, including mine, can emphasize for us why stories are important. Think of the techniques used in our primary school books of old. Consider, for example, just this one sentence from a colonial primary school text, one of the royal readers. In the story, you get the line, imagine yourself, gentle reader, watching a savage arranging his traps. And there is an image of someone described as Indian in the Americas around the Hudson Bay area in Canada, arranging his traps. Now, no big speech, no historical account, just a simple story using supposedly harmless words. And if we think they're harmless, we're already hooked into a perspective that is colonial. You, the gentle reader, are drawn into and on the side of the perspective of the white colonial writing this and presenting it to you and telling you, you gentle person, that you are on my colonial side. So you think of the Carib, the Kalinago, the Mosquito, the Mohawk, the Lenape as savage. And at that tender age, we don't even realize that an ideology is being shaped. My own marveling only happened later, long after I was the gentle reader. So when I talk about the need for stories, I am not only talking about the grand historical account. I'm talking about, you know, the fiction, the poetry, etc. Louise Little came from a group of people who, whatever the, the, the contradictions born of personal experience, and we all have those, these people were proud of themselves. And this was at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. They were proud of themselves as African. Aside from the fact that they seem to have found really thoughtful teachers at the Holy Innocents Anglican School, indications are that they were also able in the home to give their children a community and family education that sustained them. Because sometimes, you know, when we're talking about education, we forget that some of that also comes from the community, from the family. In spite of the brutality of a Jim Crow approach when Louise Langdon Little reached the United States, she kept 
those lessons from Ladig. And the mention of the Jim Crow approach is not suggesting that things were great for race in Grenada at that time, at the end of the 1890s, early 1900s, and absolutely awful in the United States. In both places, there were white colonials bent on exploitation of African labor. But by that time in Grenada, you know, uh, and, and the US, if we're looking at the two locations with whites in control in both the locations, Caribbean and the United States of America, were at different places, different phases in their project of exploitation. In the US, it was being consolidated. In the Caribbean, the white colonials were leaving, slowly, but leaving and black people and those they referred to as colored were increasingly in the majority. What the records say about Louise Little's family experience suggests that they had severe personal experience of white colonial brutality. Research suggests that the family may have closed in on itself and not chosen to share all of that horror with the world. The larger issue for us as writers, as thinkers though, is I feel how that links with the survival, migration, remaking, the struggle of individuals and community in the post-emancipation period. Louise Langdon's story, at home and in the diaspora, is a story of struggle, survival, triumph, disappointments. She was born in Ladig towards the end of the 19th century, went to Holy Innocence Anglican School, left for Canada in 1917, married and moved to the United States in 1919. And you heard um, some of this already. Worked as an activist in the Garvey movement. The family was terrorized by the Klan. Her husband was killed in 1931, allegedly by white supremacists. Her eight children were farmed out to different families by the US social services. In 1938, she was put into a mental institution and she stayed there for some 26 years and was taken out of there by her children in 1963. She died in 1991. So hers was a long, complex, sometimes apparently even contradictory journey. And it seems to me that it has a lot to teach us. At the time when Louise Langdon went to primary school in Grenada, early 20th century colonial Caribbean, about half of those or even less registered for elementary education actually attended school. But Louise Langdon was one of those who did. Perhaps even more importantly, we hear the evidence of this from her children and especially from the oldest, Wilfred Little, who remembers not only the white teachers in Michigan who did not encourage them to succeed, but also the teacher at home. Huh? That's what Wilfred remembers more. The mother and educator who told them they could do it, who took what she felt good from the school education and Wilfred Little tells us, taught them the lessons again when they came home from school, taking out the things she felt diminished them. <laughs> you know, saying, well, you know, you don't have to take on a teacher on this one. Yeah, let me tell you. So she was a teacher at home. She taught them that they were part of a black international. She gave them also lessons that she remembered from the Holy Innocence Primary School, St. Andrews, Grenada. And when I read some of the things that Wilfred says she taught them, I say, uh-huh, I know where that came from, you know? So these are really important things for Ladig, I would say, for us to think about. And think how progressive Louise Langdon was for her generation, that although presented with models of white colonial heroes. She followed the ideas about blackness and black internationalism 
taught by someone like Marcus Garvey, also Caribbean, Jamaican, who even then critiqued aspirations toward whiteness and colonial mores. She was not at the end of the 20th century or 21st century like us, looking back, understanding, critiquing Garvey. She was involved at that time. So she was part of the ferment of Black political thought during the early 20th century, questioning enough to participate in a Black political movement and to teach, teach her children what she believed to be correct. So let us be proud of her. She was writing her own story, giving an example to her children. And it is certainly partly because of his mother, Louise Langdon from La Digue, St. Andrew, Grenada, that the world talks today about the ideas and journey of another son, Malcolm X, a figure who dared to be controversial, to follow what he believed and to be in the public spotlight as he grew, always transforming his ideas. And let me pause here, you know, move away from the mother a little bit to talk about the influence of the son. Because to some extent, um, the interest of Grenadians in acknowledging the importance of Louise Little depends a bit on perceptions of her son, Malcolm X. I know that I have been asked by some individuals two key questions. Why is this important? And what is this thing anyway with Malcolm and X as a last name? Right? Um, is that important? And I'm pleased that, you know, people, friends who thought they could ask me this did in fact ask me. And in fact, someone in Ladigue asked me, he, meaning Malcolm, know anything about us? He ever come here? No, but his brother Wilfred, oldest and the one closest to his mother's ideas did. And this concerns Grenada, knowing to value what Ladig taught and passed on. And we should also say that Wilfred lived a lot longer than Malcolm. But think about it. whether or not we choose X as a last name, the story is this. African people taken to the Caribbean, the grandparents of Malcolm X and others, simply had their names taken away. It happened, of course, in other parts of the Americas. In the south of what is today the United States of America, Malcolm X's father and his father's people acquired the last name Little because the white planters who stole the labor and or who lived in and around Georgia where they found themselves were called little. So all of us have these European surnames. Collins is one. Louise Langdon had the last name Langdon because some of the white planters and colonial civil service figures who organized labor activities in the 19th century in Grenada had the last name Langdon, and the last name was given to some Africans whose labor they used. When found as a black person's name in the 19th century, it meant that this was someone who perhaps Mr. White Langdon enslaved, or if it was after the period of enslavement, um, Mr. Langdon's worker, so a Langdon. In the 19th century, people were closer to the thing actually happening. Huh? So the outrage could be greater then. But at least we should know enough of the history and appreciate the efforts of those thinking about it. In 1863 in Grenada, at about the time you begin to have the last name Langdon in the historical records for Grenadians, meaning now for Black Grenadians, there was a white John Langdon who was an attorney for proprietors of estates on the eastern and northeastern sides of Grenada, the parishes of St. David and St. Andrew, where the Langdons, uh, Louis Langdon's family um, settled. The records tell us that in 1863, John Langdon requisitioned 
26 Africans from Mirabeau. And I think this is around the time that the Langdons, uh, that uh, the grandparents came in. 26 Africans from Mirabeau, 10 for Sincere, both in areas where many Black Langdons later lived. The White Langdon, John Langdon, was also elected to the Legislative Council in 1862. So the Langdons were white and in positions of influence in Grenada. And when in Grenada's stories and in stories of colonized communities generally, uh, we talk about a white Langdon and a black Langdon, or you know, whatever the name is, a white last name and an Indian one. We are really talking about issues of colonialism and power. And of course, there are other possibilities. For example, in the course of this research, one Grenada Langdon who spoke to me, uh, um, I realized that she got her name from a consensual Black-white relationship known about in the family. So just by way of information and understanding of our complexities, that is important. But most of the Black Langdons in Grenada got their names in other ways that were about a master-servant power dynamic. So our surnames, our last names often tell a complex tale of dispossession or the fact that our ancestors could keep original names might sometimes signal class, year of arrival, etc. And we can tell these stories in fiction, in poetry, because the stories help us understand how our societies were created. And just, you know, in the course of my research, in, in one historical document, a child's Christian name is entered as Felicia, and the surname for both Felicia um, and her parents is entered on the document as a coolie on preference estate. That's the, That's what is in the surname column. Mm? And in one 1876 case, the child's name is Martha. And in the surname column, I see African. So complete loss of the original name. Presumably, this Martha is a liberated African, someone who entered the country after abolition, after emancipation, because this is 1876 in Grenada. And in communities, sometimes a hierarchy developed because of the stories told by European colonials about savages and uncivilized people. Those with the European names could come to feel superior to those they thought of as African or Indian unfortunates. So let us celebrate the fact that Louise Langdon from La Digue, St. Andrew, Grenada, had African relatives, the oral narratives say, grandparents proud of Africa, who were able to tell her to keep pride in that part of her inheritance, even while she took in the colonial primary school education that she was given. Her son Malcolm and her other children embody both religious preferences and a critique of colonialism in the choice of X as a last name. So we have to write her story in, in literature, in history, in poetry, in song. And thank you, wizard, the Calypsonian, the mighty wizard, Elwin McQuilkin, also from La Digue, has just recorded a song about Louise Langdon Little. Uh, we have to write stories in which the hillsides of Ladigue appear, stories in which a young man leaving Ladigue for Canada describes himself, uh, which we see in the documents as West Indian and African. Uh, this was Louise Little's uncle going to Canada in 1913. So it seems that this was a family culture that Louise Langdon came from as well, part of her in inheritance um, from, you know, from Ladig. Inheritance, yes, from the Ladig um, primary school, from the Anglican school, and also the socialization that came from the family. And I think it is important to the stories of Grenada that a young Grenadian woman in the 1920s tells her children 
about a black experience that is not only in the United States of America, but is in Grenada, uh, in the wider Caribbean, in the world, that in the diaspora, she contributes to helping her children develop a sense of themselves. These young black children in the United States of America, then called Negro, only if people chose to be polite, that she contributes to their sense of themselves as part of a black international. Wilfred Little, who was the oldest of the children, writes about that. Louise Langdon traveled with stories from Ladigue, and Wilfred writes about that. Even before she left Grenada, she valued the example of Grenada's political thinker, T.A. Marichaud. Hmm? And remember, she was 20, 21, yeah, at that time. Later, she valued the stories about Black life told by Marcus Garvey and by her uncle in Montreal who helped raise money to support the Garvey movement. And at, at this point, I have to say thank you, Terence, family member in Grenada, because stories told within the family, family details still remembered among some in Ladigue and elsewhere are important to our understanding and to our recreation of the experience. For various reasons then, the children were comfortable with removing the names of the white Langdon colonial, the white Norton colonial. In fact, in the autobiography of Malcolm X, we are told by Malcolm that his mother, Louise, told him that her father, last name Norton, was a rapist. If so, the white Norton name could certainly be X'd out without regret. Perhaps it is there at all because of the patriarchal view that it is important to have a father's name, even if the father is a white sailor planter figure who was a rapist. Now, some have a different take on the viability of the story of rape, but I think, you know, all of it, whether, um, whatever our take on it, all of it is important. And if Malcolm's memory is truthfully recorded in his autobiography, it suggests that white plantation owners in Grenada as elsewhere got away with a multitude of evils. And we know they did because people felt what one researcher refers to as post-colonial shame. Sometimes victims feel ashamed instead of placing the shame where it should be. And whiteness was and continues to be valuable currency. And that too is a part of our very complex post-colonial story. Then of course, there is a white little colonial of the Jim Crow era from whom Louis Little's husband Earl got his last name. If you choose to do so, replace it with an X while you think through who you are and how you and many people within black colonized humanity have come to have names that are European. And I spent so much time talking about this, you know, because I know that a couple of people actually challenged me about that saying, you know, why we have to remember him anyway. So we can be proud of Louise Little from Ladigue for giving her children from home the kind of education that made them feel good about themselves. So that as they went through various experiences on their journeys, even did things that they might not be so proud of later, they came back to tell each other to remember what our mother would say or remember how Ma would do, which is what the oldest Wilfred says he told his younger brother Malcolm when Malcolm was in prison. Remember Ma? Louise Langdon's story and the way her children tell it, and I think that is very important, makes me say, celebrate the mothers. Celebrate her, Louise Langdon Little, mother, educator, teacher from the hillsides of Ladigue and from Ladigue Anglican School. Let us write about her. 
in various ways and understand the importance of writing stories of many others, not only Louise Langdon Little from Grenada and from working communities around the world. Thank you for listening. <laughs>